Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am delighted to introduce this virtual event with Tamiko Bayer, presenting her new collection of poetry, Last Days, featuring readings by Gabrielle Seville. I hope you're all well and safe and hanging in there. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. We're hosting events every weeknight right here on Zoom. And just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com where you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase last days on harvard.com as well as a link to donate in support of the series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm honored to introduce our speakers. Tamiko Bayer is the acclaimed author of We Come Elemental, Dovetail co-authored with Kimiko Han, and Bow Breaks. Her poetry and articles have been published widely, including by Denver Quarterly, Idaho Review, Lit Hub, and The Rumpus. She has received awards, fellowships, and residencies from Pan America, Kundeman, Hedgebrook, Vona, and the Australia Lesbian Writers Fund, among others. She publishes Starlight and Strategy, a monthly newsletter for living life wide awake and shaping change. And she is a queer, mixed race, Japanese and white, cisgender woman and femme living on Massachusetts, Wampanoag and Pawtucket land. Joining her this evening is Gabrielle Seville, a black feminist performance artist, poet and writer originally from Detroit, Michigan. She has premiered 50 performance works around the world, and her performance memoirs include Swallow the Fish, Experiments in Joy, and the forthcoming Ghost Gestures, winner of the Gold Line Nonfiction Chapbook Contest selected by Bonnie Capil. Her writing has also appeared in Experiments in Joy, a workbook, Dancing While Black, Small Axe, Obsidian, Bone Bouquet, and the anthologies Black in the Middle, Kitchen Table Translation, and New Daughters of Africa. A 2019 Rima Hort Mann LA Emerging Artist, she teaches creative writing and critical studies at California Institute of the Arts. With the launch of Last Days, Tamiko and Gabrielle are joining forces for a new kind of book launch, one that centers an ethos of collaboration, abundance, and solidarity, and alternatives to capitalism's forced scarcity and competition, in line with Tamiko's work in social and environmental justice. They've teamed up to gift copies of their books to organizers, writers, activists, and culture workers. And tonight they'll be sharing our virtual stage to read from work that, as Anna Joy Springer says of Gabrielle's collection, Experiments in Joy, enacts rather than professes transdisciplinary theories on interbeing, interrupture, and interbecoming for the subtlest, hungriest, and wisest organ of admittance, the mind heart, which will not suffer bullshit. Kimiko Han praises the gorgeous poems in Tamiko's new book for their deft slippage between forms and identity categories and implores us to enter into this collection of last days and enjoy powerful discoveries in her crossings and lines. And now I'm so excited to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Tamiko and Gabrielle. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, we're so happy. I'm so happy to be here tonight. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm very excited to celebrate the launch of Last Days here with you all. And I'm so honored and thrilled um, to be reading with Gabrielle um, and to be partnering with her um, on this project of giving away our books to organizers and activists. Um, and so without further ado, um, it's all you, Gabriel. Wow. Thank you so, 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 so much. It is such a thrill and a delight to be here with some positive news on my mind. I just feel the days have been heavy and challenging. And I mean, as part of my work with Experiments in Joy, has taught me, especially in times 
of oppression, despair. Um, we need to celebrate the triumph of our voices coming out into the world. And I am so delighted and happy to be here to celebrate Tamiko's new book and the sort of successful fundraising for the project that will allow for organizers and activists to receive our work. I'm so honored to be a part of that project. So let's get started here. I'm gonna start with a little bit of From the Hive, from experiments in joy. It started with stories of origins, Blackfoot physics and Paula thoughts are for the taking such strange news coming from all directions. Like the shy woman who carries the water, the message is survive. In your new journal with the plump robins and a pattern on the cover, the language coming poetry now, you wrote, not like the news tells you to, but like the bee instructs in the flower, molten, gold, open. You wrote beauty as a way of walking, not as a way of looking. You wrote what shimmers in body with body. When all of the paper leaves her hands, E goes over to place a kiss on, G, she, on G's cheek. E and G move their bodies, unfurl and arrive in space. G says what shimmers in body with body, tasked with body, we walk together, tasked with body. I wanna lift up my dear friend, Ellen Marie Hinchcliffe, who um, co-wrote this piece from the hive and performed it with me. And I wanted to start with something collaborative because I feel like this is a collaborative moment between Tamiko and myself and that's really great. And, and I guess I just wanna offer one other thing in honor of Tamiko's incredible um, political consciousness in this project. And also with the awareness that many of us have heavy hearts in the midst of this terrible trial in Minneapolis and in the kind of siege and perpetual anti-Black violence that continues even just 10 miles away from that trial. So I wanna really um, lift up the family of Dante, lift up the family of George, lift up our human family and try to push beyond this unnecessary violence, breaking the frame. How can we mobilize art in new ways? How can we flip the script and disrupt the discourse? How can we subvert expectations and stimulate change? After years of high profile extrajudicial killings of Black people, I am struck by how much action and reaction seem to follow a strict script. State violence, non-indictment, outcry, demonstration, greater militarization, protest, vigil, reset, do it all again. This script has framed the nature of our work as artists and the nature of our lives as citizens. And when I say citizen, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have paperwork. It's the people who belong and who are there in the place or who belong to the place in their hearts. This frame needs to be broken. At the same time, our artistic responses are often equally wrote. The same songs sung the same way, the same elegies, the same murals to the fallen, the same candle lit orations, the same frustration and helplessness. As a Black feminist performance artist, as a grieving citizen, I crave more. I believe deeply in the power of experimental art and artistic experiments to transform consciousness and communities. To this end, I wanna break the frame, reconsider the forms, sites, materials, practices and audiences of our work. Rethink which art for which people, when and where, how and why. 
In a nation as divided and dangerous as this one is now, we need artists more than ever to witness, console, listen, disrupt, commiserate, tell the truth, and dream. So it seems to me <laughs> that this alternate book launch that Tamiko has strategized and fundraised and so amazingly brought me into is an example of how an artist can break the frame. And I'm hopeful that we can all continue to follow that example. And I wanna to try to live up to my own, I mean, this is like aspiration. I wanna live up to that idea of breaking the frame myself. Okay, but this is also a party, right? It's also a celebration. <laughs> so I wanna take something, this is from my uh, forthcoming chat book, uh, Ghost Gestures. Here, I'll show you. <laughs> this is the cover. It'll be out May 15th. I'm really excited. And the fantastic poet and desire, des poet and designer, Kinji C. Liu, designed this cover. And I'm really thrilled. So May 15th, it'll be out. And this is the book that will be gifted along with last days to the organizers and these organizations who sign up and want to read it. So this is from Detroit, which is where I'm from. Anybody there? Detroit, my people? Okay, Detroit on black parties and spirit. There has to be food and drink, drinks and music and you need to be able to wear your shoes inside because sometimes your shoes are the best part of your outfit. Teetering high heels or hard black boots or sneakers straight out the box. A party makes your shoes dancing shoes and the height of a party is dancing. Kick back, kick up your heels, make merry, make light, take flight, flow. Celebrate and savor, simmer into crescendo, a volume of voices loud or low. It's all good as long as you hear a hum of pleasure, a crackle of satisfaction. This comes to me by blood. Haitian children dressed in the frilliest dresses, yellow and pink and sky blue, or in tiny suits with jackets and ties, accompanying their immigrant parties to a fete. Or on the other side, at a barbecue with chicken and beer, listening to soul. Down in the basement, my parents in the 60s in Detroit mingling these two strains with family and friends. One group, just off the boat, and the other not too far from the cotton field. The way they moved with Caribbean flavor, Southern warmth and Motown soul, there had to be some Africa in there too, right? They would dance all night until six in the morning, the children secretly jumping on the bed upstairs until they fell asleep in heaps. People swallowed fire at those parties walked on glass. My mother and godmother in their new slick falls. My father, my godfather, my uncle, all clean shaven, looking sharp as a tack. My cousin Gislain dancing hard to Guantanamera in the center of the floor. Boule de Fay in another spot doing the same. I saw Boule at Haitian New Year's gathering a few years ago with gray hair, and a walker, he was still throwing down. And those nights at those parties, women did the spirit dance, ran forward and thrust their chests out and then ran back a dance black women have been doing for centuries, wiggling, twisting, grinding, holding on to their men, holding on to each other, letting go, catching up, getting free, getting up, getting down, doing their best to get to glory. A party is a conjuring of magical space, an invitation, an offering, a remembering, flushed and pulsing. Together, they silently cajoled, bring this here, bring this back, keep this here, bring us back, bring us here, bring us back to this.
It's interesting that the title of Tamiko's book is Last Days, because a big preoccupation for me right now is time. Um, in the book that's coming out um, after Last Days, a book is coming out in 2022 from me called The Deja Vu from Coffee House Press. And there's a whole, there's a lot of riffs about the end of the world and thinking also about what is the nature of black time? What is the nature of black dreams? So that's something I've been thinking about a lot. In ghost gestures, I'm also interested in time and historical time. And specifically, um, I start to explore the last days of Anakauna, who was um, an indigenous queen of what is now Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So I made a performance about Anakauna, or really interested in that figure, that foremother ancestral um, indigenous figure who, even though, I mean, these African displaced African people were not necessarily and at least initially weren't at all connected by blood. This figure, Anakauna, is so claimed, especially in Haiti, and I believe also in the Dominican Republic. And so I claim her as well. So it's just a little smidgen of that. On the screen, the word Anakauna in red. Walk backwards body memory of gestures moving back into the queen walk clear missteps and repetitions. Jamaica Kincaid, her heels, only her heels coming down to meet me forever autobiography of my mother. I return to my throne, my chair attached to me with red ribbon and begin to speak. Smear gold. If I tell you I know Anakaona, then you know that I am lying. Russet skin, fleshy eyelids, a recurring dream, the obvious, a white slip, lips like a flattened heart. If I say I see Anakaona, red bone, almond eyes, lips like a slit, flattened heart, a void. You know that I am a strain, lying, men of a certain age, hum, an expected salsa, Anakaona. Look at my heels, my diadem, something rending, can't make the journey. Aye, bombe, aye, bombe. Africa will come soon, the meaning of her name. Ana Kaona, flower of gold. I cherche de l'or, de l'or, de l'or, or, 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 confess my own lack, named and floating. I smear the standard of history. The last thing I'll read <laughs> is a deeper rumination on Black time. Um, the Deja Vu is an exploration or really kind of a materialization of Black dreams and Black time. And I put this whole beautiful, I think it's beautiful, I hope it's beautiful manuscript together. And a really good friend of mine was like, this is great, but I want to know more directly. What do you actually think about Black time? So I looked and I thought, you know what, maybe I want, I should expound upon this more. So. I looked at what I had and I was like, okay, let's go for it. So here we go. Sphericity on black time. Begin with flatness, make a line. 
Now turn the line into a square. Now turn the square into a circle. Now turn the circle into a sphere. Now turn the sphere into a globe. Now turn the globe into a world. Now turn the world into a spiral. Now turn the spiral into a shell. Welcome to Black Time. Reacting to an earthquake in Haiti, rolling into a mound of dirt, holding a shovel over my face, tangling myself up in paper from cash register rolls, walking back into Black Atlantic, releasing myself in waves, submerging, trying to dissolve, holding a mirror over my face, confronting history and reflecting sky, then, years later, or maybe centuries now, returning to a mound of dirt encircled by a hundred foot extension cord, extension cord circling, this is a power line coiling around my feet, walking and tracing the line, charging into past and future, holding a shell in my hands. Holding this shell, I hold a spiral of black time within a spiral of black time, repeating and changing, reckoning and grieving, resurfacing and harnessing, regenerating power. Black time is not flat, is multidirectional, is multimodal, is global, is diasporic, is dispersed, is jam packed, is overextended, is can I call you back? Is I'm not always there when you call, is I'm always on time, is early, is on time, is on time, is late, is right and right and right on time, is day after day, is the changing same, is taking a long time, is at the same time, is taking twice as much time, is being twice as good to get half as much time, is double consciousness and double time, is aftermath and aftershocks, is aspiration, is hurry up and wait, is one step forward, two steps back, is back to life, back to reality, is go back and fetch it, is flop and drop, is off the clock, is Flavor Flav's clocks, is maybe Flavor Flav's teeth, is how long it takes for Afrosheen to come out the nozzle, is how long it takes for the hot comb to heat, is, ah, aha, is, how long it takes I go back. Y'all gotta know this. This is so new. I'm just reading this. I'm so excited. Is maybe Flavor Flav's teeth is how long it takes for Afro Sheen to come out the nozzle. Is how long it takes for the comb to heat. Is how long it took you to grow that hair. It's how long it takes for the hair to grow back. It's how long it takes to bargain at the market. It's how long it would take to forgive the debt. It's how long it would take for lotion to fix my ash if it could, is never ending, is this pandemic, is taking a long time, is what we make, not what we have. It's what happens if we take our time. It's what happens, is what happens when time takes us back. And I'll stop right there. Thank you so, 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 so much for the opportunity for, to share my work tonight. And I just can't wait now to turn it back over to Tamiko and hear from this new work, Last Days. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. That was amazing. I loved every moment of that reading. I love the idea. I mean, the, the shell, the circle into the world, into the shell. So good. I'm so glad you read that piece. Thank you. Um, so I am... Um, yeah, let's see. I'm so happy to be reading from last days. Um, and I wrote this book. I don't know if you can see it, if you guys have it yet, but I wrote it as a um, poetic practice of radical imagination for our current political and environmental crises. Um, and it explores how we might change the conditions we find ourselves into usher in a future that is more beautiful, more just, more loving than we can e ever imagine, or that we can even imagine. Hopefully we can ever imagine it. Um, and I was so thrilled to have the artwork by um, the movement artist, Jessica Snow. 
um, on this cover. It's it's from a mural that they painted in Philadelphia. Um, and I, I feel like it just really captures the essence of what I hope the book communicates. So um, yeah, it is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful work of art. And <clears throat> we actually created a poster um, to accompany our um, new kind of book launch that incorporates this art piece. So um, that is also, we'll be, we'll be sending that as well to the poet and activist, or to the activists and organizers who um, sign up for our books. Um, so tonight I'm gonna read a short poem th that opens the book. And then I'm gonna read from um, a prose poetry sequence um, that's in the middle of the book. And um, that's all I'm gonna read. So it's it's kind of a long reading, but I it, it tells a story. So hopefully um, you'll you'll come along with me on that. Um, <clears throat> so the first poem is called What It Means to Be Human. Remember when we were very young, we could disappear and then reappear in the next room. Our animal muscles have galloped along in spite of our flawed sense of time. I am the magic of a raised fist. We break so easily, rib, shoulder, psyche. Suddenly, or over the drag of decades, then a beloved lights a match. A stranger brings a glass of water one by one, we touch our fingers to our wings, and then the steady thrum. So I got really obsessed with um, how, oh, I, with this idea of what if birds and humans merged in some far distant future, and that's the way we survive. So there's a lot of like wing wings on shoulder imagery, bird imagery throughout this book. Um, but not in this piece that I'm going to read next. Um, this is um, a sequence that follows a small group of revolutionaries who are taking down the corporate empire. Um, and as they do, the central character comes to understand her own power and to trust her intuition. Um, and that's really what I hope um, folks who read this book who are doing social change work day in and day out, like I hope that that um, resonates as, as you read it, like how much power we each have um, individually and then also collectively, more important probably collectively. So, um, so there are prose sections um, and then there are poems that are interspersed that are titled Ancestor Chorus. Um, which are messages from the ancestors. And then there are also quotes woven in, each, each section starts with a quote, but then throughout the prose section, there are quotes from Audre Lorde, Sun Tzu, Homi Baba, Claudia Rankin, and Kate Green, Greenstreet. So, um, and uh, there are four sections and an epilogue. So this is last days, one. Safe is an interpretation, Kate Greenstreet. We didn't expect the eagerness that filled us on the last days of empire. For what, we couldn't exactly say. Metal glistened on the streets in the hot September days, the sun no longer a dandelion, the sun most definitely a muzzle. When it set, the corporation keen to kill the dark flipped the switch. Then the marble facades of the buildings were suddenly uplit, streetlights swirled incandescent, and thousands of people hurtled through the furnace of synthesized, synthesized laughter, pop songs, and an unlimited desire for all. Some of us were on the edges, blocking out the canned sounds and lights as best we could, building something new, something old. We could feel the northern half of the planet begin to tilt away from the sun. I am on the cusp of change and the curve is shifting fast. It was an experiment, experience and then it was a memory and then a system of belief, a way to navigate the dissolving world. 
I wanted to become more salt wind, less reflection, to become quiet enough to hear the ancestors. Ancestor chorus. Find the source at the underwater roots at the mud line. Fragile strands of a new language among cattails and seed casings. Trust the fibers will lean in the right direction, will not mislead you. Child, we have always laid one strand over, then under, over and under, over and under until something like true meaning emerges from the twist of our fingers. This basket is for you, an exhortation, a map. Soon you will need to reach all of us in this river of time with the truest sentences you can weave. There were five of us in that small apartment hauling water, coding and decoding, soldering metal, constructing strategies, drafting poems. I lifted heavy objects and learned to stitch up an open wound. I no longer thought of myself as a girl. I was often afraid. At the same time, I glistened in the everyday fever brought on by waves, eyes opening, the morning sky breaking. When we met, waves said holding on was dangerous. The taste of hope could make us reckless. I knew what she meant, but despite ourselves, I came to love how she tasted more than I loved any fruit on my tongue. Ancestor Chorus. Light breaks the glass separating you from the present. The dangerous words chime in the wind, spike into sand and grass. Behold the other kind of blade, power of seed turned blossom, turned fruit. In the afternoons, we would cross the river on the train, skimming ancient tracks into the center of the city where things were bought and sold on a grand scale. We slid into the gaps of commerce, knowing all warfare is based on deception. So many people were building scaffolding against crumbling structures, using incantations from their fathers as mortar. But some attempted to excavate the signals buried deep within their bodies. Some tried to listen with their heartbeats. Those were the ones we were looking for. We slipped them a scrap of paper, then dissolved back into the crowd. Ancestor Chorus. Words can obscure like clouds or reveal like the tidal pull. Do you remember rain? The state of emergence is also always, sorry, the state of emergency is also always the state of emergence. Where does water go when ocean draws out its lowest tide? When the new recruits followed the poem to find us, we put them to work or gave them maps to others in need of their skills. We were hundreds of loose groups across the country fashioning transformation out of starlight and strategy, spindrift and solidarity. I was impatient for the waking, the sharp sensation of light and promise. I thought I understood, but there was still so much to learn. Wave reminded me of the libraries they had shut down years ago, their floors like silk, books heavy with promise. So that's where we went, picking the locks, scraping away the dust, memorizing what we could. Power grids, water, sewer lines, and optic cables snaked their way across the city. We became deft in mapping and coordinates, diversion and distraction. We discovered the patterns the corporation relied on, found the black back doors, planted the traps with care. Creating new economies in the heart of capital required cunning and poetic imagination. We knew we were being watched when nice drones paused above our fire escape. But cooking and dancing were not yet crimes. We could plan just as well stirring the pot in three, four time as in stillness around the kitchen table. Patience is in the living, time opens up to, out to you. We hummed and we sang, we simmered soup and kneaded flour and water. We mapped the next tactics. Two, the body with its arms up is a kind of miracle. 
Aracelis Germain. We knew it would change and it did. Mostly we were prepared for it, but the cold policing still struck us hard. We got the warning just in time from Roe down at the bodega. The cops were sawing at the heavy chains across the door downstairs. I strapped the typewriter to my back and Wave gathered up her colored notebooks as the cops' boots thundered up the stairwell. The kitchen window jammed. Wave heaved her shoulder under the sash and it budged a few more inches. Tara and May slid out, scaled down the fire escape. Wave followed, but when I tried, the typewriter got wedged and I couldn't move. The corporate police battered their rifle butts at the door we had reinforced with steel months ago. Wave put her arms around my ribs and pulled. I toppled out, our arms tight around each other. We shimmied down the rope and traveled, traveled fast out of the city's most rumbling sections. Tara and May went south across the harbor. Rose stayed to break the code. Wave and I ran tight together, broadcasting alarm signals over encrypted channels. We spoke the words leaning into dangerous conversations. We knew there was at least one spy among us, but we had to take the risk. Ancestor Chorus, say a name and see its familiar float by. The present was a sheet of glass suspended in midair. We loosened our fists, wiped down the sweat, then gripped again. We became intimately familiar with our weapons and the soles of our feet with ghost as a verb. We walked north, mostly on frontage roads. Even though we had been preparing all this time, we had thought somehow it might turn out differently. But we were queers and people of color. We grew up learning how to read the signs on white people's faces, on the hands of cops, and in the sound of breaking glass. We knew it was long past time. Ancestor Chorus. And then the fall, the syntax strange days, translate tree roots, terror. The code will be full of false starts, trap doors, dead ends. Where your shadow rises, keep your ear to the sky. Make meaning from ground up, the only way to pray. Three, words work as a release. Well-oiled doors opening and closing between intention, gesture, words encoding the bodies they cover. Claudia Rankin. Turns out the corporate code was less verb than adjective. I should have known, I should have anticipated it would show us only the glittering decorations and never the bones. The instructions felt funny in my mouth and I could feel deep in my gut that they weren't quite right. But Roe, still in the city, insisted they were solid. I tried opening my mouth again, but couldn't summon anything. Wave looked at me for a long time, patient like the ever repeating ocean we were headed toward. Who was I to contradict Roe, who had been in this for so much longer than me? Since Occupy, at least, he always said. Listen, I think I started just as we heard the dull whine of a drone. Wave grabbed my hand and we ran low to the ground into a building that was part iron, part rust, part decomposing vegetative matter. The explosions disoriented me from the horizon. I thought about how the sound of the, of the letter L mimics the fold between sky and earth, how that was easier to distinguish than where water meets the sky, the lapping W. There's a meaning underneath, I said to wave as the ancient window shattered and we covered our heads with our arms. I wanted five minutes with the typewriter and code, but there was no time. We heard three more dr drones arriving. Wave located a storm drain. We pried the cover off with a piece of rebar and then it was all dark and stink, slime and shadow for miles. Ancestor chorus. Blades, cusp of a season, wet territories wax and wane with strategy. Incipient boundaries, south node, the open door, see anger turn stride, see stride turn tide, because it is not the horizon you are fighting for, child. No, the whole damn sea and sky. Possibly Roe was a spy, we never found out. When we emerged from the subterranean labyrinth after midnight, we found a town shut tight, asleep, but bristling with corporate flags. 
our signal gone, no code, no text from Roe or anyone. Even with the stink of sewer clinging to me, I smelled it, the salt in the air, and then the rhythmic crashing, oceans exhale. Listen, I whispered, this time without falter. I hear it, Wave whispered, grinning back. I made a mistake, I said. We shouldn't have followed Rose instructions. I knew it three days ago. I knew it, but I couldn't say it. Wave nodded. It's hard to trust the body. We reach the beach in silence. The rolling waves, the wind, the night are two tiny bodies at the edge of the vast sea. We waded into the cold shock and then wave dove head first into her rising namesake, her hair streaming behind her, her arms arcing into the night. Where our power resides was never a conceptual question. I understood that now, shivering under the piercings of light in the night sky. Wading out of the ocean, Wave said, the only time I was truly trapped was in that other city, landlocked, no sea wind, no grace. I nodded, let's dance. And we did, holding each other tight, our bodies flaring. Four, I'm a scar, a report from the front lines, a talisman, a resurrection, Audre Lorde. We buried our ruined clothes at the foot of the sea cliffs, changed into dry ones. In the growing light, we gathered seaweed scalloped along the tide line. We made a driftwood fire and ate. The sea lettuce was all ocean and chlorophyll on my tongue, salty green between my molars. My, my saliva was the light reflecting off the waves. I held my palms over the dancing flames and then held my tin cup to the sky. It became a wine glass and then the wine was a silver lake where tiny fish darted in the shadows, our friends swimming naked. Ancestor chorus, dawn, the way the day comes into focus, the sun a sudden happening on the horizon, thinnest edge of light flooding into abundance fear. Gly gulls fly into the magenta hallelujah, elegant sentences of grace. Shake the hair from your, shake the sand from your hair, child. Live the hunger edge down. Open your mouth when it rains. We began walking north again. There were others somewhere in the dunes living in shelters erected decades ago for artists and writers and then forgotten. They were unraveling language and building what comes next. One foot in front of the other, the sand packed and wet beneath us as the tide drew itself out. The heavy typewriter strapped to my shoulders. It could be another trap, I said. <clears throat> Wave turned to, look at, turned to look at me, her wild hair decked in sunlight and wind. Yes, it could. We kept walking. The shoreline rasped, the liminal space between earth and water, that was power, articulating the transition in my body. And maybe that was love, my heart opening wider to wave and the pain of the world when we breathed in, when we all breathed in, knowing that there we were in tender battle with the deepest waves within us. Epilogue. When we finally found May and Tara again, it was in another city by the sea. They, were arrived, they arrived, leading a formation of a hundred others, bikes veering into turns from all directions, hair blowing in the, in the wind. I was translating the code and waves shouted instructions, kicking up her boots and dancing. And then the army descended, corporate logos on their weapons flashing in the most vibrant digital red, white, and blue. We knew we needed to slip into the sea, mermaid, selkie, outlaw. But we had one more code to dispatch and we sent the warriors to the most lightly guarded section of the city, speakers rattling a false trail, May at the front, her bullsips bulging, bulging, Tara at the rear. I realized then that all of us in concert made up Sun Tzu's definition of a leader. Beyond the city's edge, the icy waves applauded with the ancestors, mudline and fiber, syntax and street lights, fruit and rice to share. I knew what they were saying. The words we script together are mortar and bricks of, a, of the new world. They cannot be anything but. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
hear them clapping for you, so I have to do the clapping. <laughs> that was so amazing. Oh, Thank, you. So Thank you. So I guess um, we're we're open to take questions. Um. <laughs> I love this last question that came in um, and it's sort of like, Tommy Cole, how are you so cool? <laughs> I think that's an excellent question. <laughs> it also says, how are you, oh, both? How are you both so cool? It's yeah. true, it's true, <laughs> yes. That was the second part of the question. I, I, and I appreciate very much that second part of the question. But that's also a question that I have after watching those fantastic readings. <laughs> Um, yeah, if anybody else has a question at any point, feel free to enter it in the Q&A box. Um, I am going to start off with this question for Gabrielle. It says, I would love to hear more about your writing process since performance is such an important part of your work. How does the work of drafting words on the page and the work of crafting sound and delivery intersect? Wow, thank you so much for that question. That's a really beautiful and thoughtful question. And I'm a person for whom writing and performing are very deeply intertwined and I perform in a lot of different modes so that I like to do sometimes kind of um, body art that doesn't have language at all or you know create ritual performance through activation of objects transformation of space so that's one kind of performance then I mean, this piece, the last piece that I read really allowed me to go back to my like early poetic roots and really, and I find that um, with language, whether it's on the page or in the world, melody is very important to me, the sound of language. So even if I'm drafting something on the page, I'm, off, I'm always reading it aloud. And I can, I mean, and I can go into a sing song place because I love that. So sometimes I have to cut myself back, but that's one thing that's important even on the page sound. Um, the only other thing I guess I'll say about the relationship between performance and poetry slash lyric essay nonfiction for me is I really came to making performances as a way of making and circulating, uh, circulating poetry differently. And I found that the language that I started to generate was different when it was coming out of sort of embodied exercises or movement or improvisation, let's say in a studio or with people in a dance class, or I just noticed that that language was different than what would have come out if I sat down to actually write. And that became really interesting to me. And so I like to play in both of those modes. Thank you for that thoughtful answer. Um, now we have a question for Tomiko. Um, and it says, could you talk a little bit about working with sustained narrative in poetry? I'm amazed by the combination of beautiful descriptive language and plot and the blurring of genre. How did you develop this style? And are there other poets doing this kind of work that have inspired you? Um, yeah, thank you for that great question. Um, I, let's see. Um, I don't. I, I kind of stumbled into it, honestly. Um, I didn't set out to write a long kind of prose poetry sequence, but that is what came out of me. So I um, I was I stayed at this little cabin um, on Peaks Island, uh, which is like off the coast of Maine, uh, over New Year's Eve um, many years ago, several years ago now, um, and and. I like was reading a lot and going for walks in this like snowy landscape. And this is what came out. I mean, obviously I worked on it um, since then, but like it kind of all came out over that course of the week and it was in prose. Um, but then I was like hearing the, the, the ancestor chorus. So I was hearing like poems also. And so I would, you know, write work on those. And I thought they were maybe a different piece um, and then I realized eventually that, that they actually belonged together. Um, so it was really like I, I, I think I spent seven years working on this um, sequence like this whole book took me like eight years to write for various reasons but um, that is really like that was the genesis of it and then I just started you know kind of playing around with plot. Um, I had a reader read read a uh, version of it where she was like 
like not enough was happening. Like the pacing was all wrong. Cause I don't, I don't write prose. So I don't really know how <laughs> to, to do the pacing um, or I didn't. And, and she was like, I, I think this is just like dragging too much. Um, so then I like had to learn about pacing and how to think about that. Um, but in terms of the, the question about other poets, um, <clears throat> during that week, I was reading a lot of Kate Greenstreet. She had just put out her book, Young Tamling, and that she writes um, in prose a lot and it's narrative. It's a little bit hard to decipher the narrative sometimes, like what exactly is happening. Um, but like that, that form really, I think, inspired me. And I think that's probably why I ended up writing this in the way that it did um, from that influence. So. Great, thank you so much. Ooh, okay, we have another question that just came in that says, in Tomiko's poem, The Remensions of Coding, which struck me as such a technological juxtaposition to poetry, but made me think about how poetry is a type of coding or hacking. Can you talk about how you see the role of poetry in subverting or hacking oppressive systems? I'll ask that of both of you. That's a quick, great question. Gabrielle, maybe you should start. Well, I'll, I mean, I also was actually going to ask you about coding. And so this is like a wonderful question that this person has asked because I just recently had the pleasure of hearing Lillian Yvonne Bertram read their work um, from Travesty Generator and they came to CalArts and talked with students and, and our community about programming and radical programming and really thinking about ways to disrupt sort of the logics of algorithms or set structures of language that have been imposed on us and are also really insidious. And I think that they really also made connections between that practice and the practice and possibility of poetry. And I thought that was really exciting. Um, and so definitely, I, I definitely personally believe in the role of poetry in subverting and hacking oppressive systems. And I think it's really exciting to put it in the literal kind of hacker space. Um, can you say more in terms of your own work, how you thought of it and this sort of radical band of folk that are, are revolutionaries and live in it? Yeah, I mean, I, um, so I wanted to make the main character a poet who like uses her way of thinking about the world and perceiving the world um, as a poet, she put it to work in decoding, um, you know, the, the basically the, the veneer of the corporate um, propaganda that they, the, the citizenry of this world um, receive. And so that is really where, where that, that imagery and reference to coding comes from. I, I, um, I often think about how poetry forces or invites us to think about language differently um, than in almost any other context. The associations that we make um, as readers and writers of poetry, the um, just the leaps that are possible through poetry, um, I think really um, asks us to, to like see reality differently, or it can. Um, and, and I think that's where the, the power of poetry for me comes from is like, how, how do we use it to reshape um, reshape what we're experiencing, reframe what we're experiencing, um, and, and imagine what, what's possible differently, imagine different, different ways of being. Um, and so it just seemed like a kind of perfect metaphor, um, for, for hacking and coding. And I don't know anything about coding, <laughs> um, but I have also been thinking about how our lives are so um, ruled and run by these invisible algorithms and structures that we don't create, that, that are created mostly by white men in Silicon Valley and um, the importance of uh, us taking that back. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where that came from. Thank you, both of you for that. That was so well put. Um, my final question from the chat for you is, how do you both manage collaborations in your work? 
Do you find that there are challenges working with others that you didn't expect when you're used to creating on your own? Um, yeah, I mean, I think right now, like um, in terms of collaboration that I'm working on right now, I'm working on a book um, about poetry as spell casting and I'm working on it with two other poets. Um, and it's been such a um, interesting and awesome experience. We, we've been writing together, like um, we'll each kind of go off and write. So it's mostly prose, but we'll each go off and write alone and then we'll come back and kind of merge our writings together and then edit in real time in, in a Google Doc. And it's such a different way of working. I've, I've never really worked that way before. And it has really like um, forced me to slow down and really be clear in like what I think. And like, cause often when I create, I don't, I'm not very, um, I don't really think about what I do. I like put stuff on the page and then I shape it. and. Um, kind of return to it over and over again, but like doing it in real time with other people, I actually have to be like um, very clear on, on what I think. And also like very clear on like what doesn't matter that much to me and what like where I'm open. Um, and it's been like a beautiful, beautiful experience. And I'm really excited to keep keep going on that. Um, I also would agree that collaboration can be incredibly beautiful and can be an opportunity or can and or can really invite you to be more clear and to articulate intention within process in a way that's different than when you're working on your own. I still find in collaboration that intuition is really important um, and that there's a lot of trust that has to be there because sometimes if you're working with someone on something you want to be able to say, I'm not quite sure yet why I think we should do this or why I've used this language. Um, and so to, to have enough trust with each other to feel like, okay, I'm not quite sure yet why we can come back to this later, but there's room for me still to play. There's room for you or however many years are there to play. I will say for myself, collaboration has been really generative and wonderful. I mean, experiments in joy, in fact, the subtitle of that book is Black Feminist Solos and Collaborations. And a major question in that book is, what can we do with other people that we can't do by ourselves? You know, what, you know, how, what do we learn about ourselves that we can only learn from being with other people? With that said, it can be challenging. I mean, there's a lot of vulnerability there. And as artists as well, I mean, we can be stubborn and strong-willed or, um, we can also have, I don't know, I just, I shouldn't say we, let me say I, I can be stubborn and strong-willed or I can just want to um, work in a certain way. And so that it's really important to um, actually engage with other people so that you can, I can flex, I can open, I can flow and, and learn and adjust. I think that that's an important skill, especially if we're interested in thinking of artists as social justice workers, as cultural workers, as people in community, that there's some kind of flexibility and, and um, ability to adapt and engage with different kinds of people in different ways. And I think that as, especially in writing, there's a lot about authority and building your own authority, which I think is powerful and important in terms of claiming a voice but collaboration in writing, collaboration performance, which has been a, sort of the majority of the ways that collaboration have come for me, it's been about flexibility, fluidity, adaptation. Um, and that's, those are really important skills. Yeah, I love that so much. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm, I'm so glad that we got to witness the results of your collaboration tonight and I'm so inspired by the project of what a different kind of book launch could look like sharing the stage with others. Um, did you have any final thoughts or questions for each other? I just wondered if uh, Tamika wanted to share if there are organizers in the audience or if there are people who are doing community work, what is the procedure potentially for signing up and being able to get our books? Thank you, yes. Um, I should actually have pulled that up, but 
Um, we have a sign up link. So if you want to get a book, um, you can just basically fill out a form and we'll, um, we have 250 copies available. There's about, there's less than a hundred slots left. Um, so you'll want to um, sign up soon. Um, and yeah, and then we're going to, um, sorry, I'm, I'm talking and opening things at the same time, but um, we're going to uh, be mailing things out. Uh, Gabrielle, your book is coming out in May, May 15th, right? So we're gonna be sending things out after that. Oh, Lauren got it already. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so it'll be sometime between like the end of May and June when folks will be able to get the books. Um, but yeah, that's the process. Thanks. And thank you so much again, um, Tamiko and also Lauren in the Harvard Bookstore for hosting this incredible event and for allowing us to celebrate last days and this project with last days and ghost gestures. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tamiko and Gabrielle, for your beautiful readings and this thoughtful conversation. And thanks to everyone out there for spending your night with us. Um, Thank you, everybody. Yes, please purchase Last Days. Please pre-order Ghost Gestures. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night. Keep reading and please be well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Take care. Bye.